Welcome to Nuclear Hot Seat, the weekly international news magazine keeping you up to date on all things anti-nuclear. My name is Libby Halevi. I am the producer and host, as well as a survivor of the nuclear accident at Three Mile Island from just one mile away. So I know what can happen when those nuclear so-called experts get it wrong. This week, the USS Ronald Reagan pulled into port in Japan. This is the ship that was so heavily contaminated with radiation while on an humanitarian aid mission to Fukushima that its sailors have fallen seriously ill from radiation exposure, and some have already died. What are the issues for the Japanese with its return to their waters? And how safe is the Reagan for the young U.S. sailors who are on it now? We talk first with Mr. Masahiko Goto, representative of the Yokosuka-based anti-nuclear group Coalition Concerning Home Porting of the Nuclear-Powered Carrier Vessel. We also check in with Carol Jankow, Director Emerita of Peace Resource Center of San Diego. She will share her knowledge of the Reagan from the time when it was home ported in San Diego immediately after Fukushima until it left recently for Japan. Then we will have a new feature, Filmmaker Spotlight, on Marcus Schwenzel. He is the director, writer, and producer of Seven Years of Winter a short dramatic film shot in the exclusion zone at Chernobyl. The film has just won the Yellow Oscar for Best Film at the International Uranium Film Festival in Berlin. Plus, we will have our regular numbnuts of the week, activist shout-outs, Nuclear Regulatory Commission, doc, and cover report, and more information on nuclear matters than show up in racist history textbooks in Texas. All of this coming up in just a few moments. Today is Tuesday, October 6, 2015, and here is the week's nuclear news from our perspective. The Wall Street Journal reports that scientists investigating the Fukushima power plant have confirmed that a third reactor had a serious meltdown when the 2011 earthquake and tsunami destroyed the facility. Researchers at Nagoya University and Toshiba Corporation said they have confirmed that at least 70% of nuclear fuel inside one of the reactors at Fukushima Daiichi melted down following the 2011 earthquake and tsunami. Further study confirmed that between 70% and 100% of the fuel inside the reactor has melted. This according to a Toshiba spokeswoman. Notice how they give the bad news to a woman to deliver. Nearly all the nuclear fuel in Units 1 and 3 were also found to have melted. So it's exactly what activists were saying years ago. Three meltdowns, no containment. And Tokyo Electric Power Company, the plant's owners, otherwise known as TEPCO, doesn't expect to be able to be removing debris from the trash reactors until 2021, 10 years after the meltdowns and one year after the 2020 radioactive uh, Tokyo Olympics. No accident there. A recent Japanese health ministry report shows that a number of Japanese cities are still finding traces of Fukushima-related contamination in their drinking water. Specifically, what was found was cesium-134, because that's what they were looking for. Strontium-90 was not tested in these samples. Among the cities that had traces found in their drinking water was Shinjuku-ku, which is a ward located in Tokyo. Radioactive tap water in Tokyo. Yes, yes, you I am, I am, And now, now. Nuclear hot seat. In Japan, Kyushu Electric Power Company plans to restart another one of its nuclear reactors on October 15, making it the second reactor to return to operation in the country. Where is this reactor located? Right next to the first one, at the Sendai Complex in the south of Japan. Japan's lying Pinocchio of a prime minister, Shinzo Abe baby, 
has said that the two plants can resume operation because they are going to be under, quote, the world's toughest, end quote, safety rules. That's right, Shinzo baby. 50 kilometers, 31 miles from an active volcano in a country perched on the edge of the earthquake-prone ring of fire in a typhoon tsunami zone. You're calling that safe? I don't care what rules you have got written down on paper. When Mother Nature decides to blow her top or shrug her shoulders or shake it out, honey, shake it out, you're going to be in big doo-doo and none of your rules are going to make people safe from what can happen at that reactor. And that's why you, Shinzo Abe and Kyushu Electric Power Company and all of the people who are behind the restart of the two reactors at Sendai Complex, you are this week's Nuclear Hot Seed, none that's not awake. Bringing it home to the U.S., where at the Y-12 nuclear weapons plant in Oak Ridge, Tennessee, where, according to sources, there is an unnumbered abundance of 55-gallon drums used for storage and transport of waste materials, at least one of the drums has been found to be bulging, and a couple of others had what were termed abnormal indications. This echoes the problem of the exploding 55-gallon drum of waste from Los Alamos that contaminated the underground at the Waste Isolation Pilot Plant, or WIP site, in Carlsbad, New Mexico, and released both plutonium and americium into the environment. Last June, Y-12, which was the site of Sister Megan Rice's successful protest of nuclear weapons, mistakenly shipped more special nuclear material than intended to an off-site facility, unnamed but probably WCS in Texas. But let's bring it on back to Los Alamos, where they are running out of room to store their nuclear waste. The Defense Nuclear Facility Safety Board said in a recent report that the Los Alamos lab will reach its maximum capacity for storing radioactive transuranic waste sometime in the federal fiscal year that starts in October 2016, which means by October of 2017, ain't going to be no more space for them to store it. No wonder Energy Secretary Ernest Moniz is pushing like mad for the WIP site to reopen when it's just not possible. And it's also why WCS, Waste Control Specialist in Andrews, Texas, is now working furiously to get the contract to store radioactive waste in that state. Didn't their mothers ever tell them that if they make a mess, they have to clean it up? In Missouri, St. Louis County has released its disaster plan should the underground fire at the Bridgeton landfill reach illegally buried nuclear waste in the nearby Westlake landfill. First, after years of ignoring this problem, a bracing hit of honesty. The 11-page document warns that there is a potential for radioactive fallout to be released in the smoke plume and spread throughout the region. It claims this event will most likely occur with little or no warning. Local resources may not be adequate and there will be a need for assistance from federal sources, the private sector, and volunteer organizations. The plan envisions designated evacuation routes, with police and barricades controlling the flow of traffic. Transportation at designated pickup areas using church or school buses would be provided for evacuees who don't have their own transportation. Mass media, text messages, and public address systems on the county's tornado warning sirens would be used to alert the public if a landfill emergency exists. Good for them. It isn't going to work because panic, hysteria, clogged roads. You think a police barricade is going to control the flow of traffic when people are trying to escape radiation? Did you even read what happened at Three Mile Island? Experienced activists have been all over social media explaining exactly why this process will not work. We'll try and get some interviews for you and keep you informed. St. Louis has had years to see this coming and have only moved off the dime 
in the last month. Now, fasten your seatbelts for the largest ever nuclear hot seat, nuclear regulatory commission, duck, <laughs> and cover report. In Pilgrim at Massachusetts at the foot of Cape Cod, on October 1st, it was revealed that if a radiation leak had occurred at Pilgrim on eight occasions over the last three years, operators would have been forced to rely on the National Weather Service to provide the meteorological information needed to tell them which regions were in danger of contamination. Because in 2011, Entergy, the slumlords, the owner-operators of canceled preventive maintenance on the plant's meteorological towers, and they became non-functional. The NRC first noted this status in 2013, but at the time, federal officials said the finding was rated as low in the safety significance because nothing had happened as a result, to which Nuclear Hot Seat adds, yet. On October 2nd, as Hurricane Joaquin was bearing down on the East Coast as a Category 4 storm, Cape Cod Baywatch revealed that if the waves at the Pilgrim site amount to 10 feet during the storm, there could be splashover in the switchyard and begin the unplanned outage season at Pilgrim. Didn't know that was a season. And on Monday, October 5th, the NRC identified vulnerabilities in two specific fire areas at Pilgrim that required what was called a compensatory fire watch, and they shut the plan down for further analysis. <laughs> on Sunday, October 4th, the NRC declared an unusual event at Nuclear Power Complex in Waterford, Connecticut, because the reactor coolant system leaked at a rate of greater than 25 gallons per minute. Think about it. <coughs> In Vermont, that state wanted to continue monitoring the radiological activity at the decommissioned nuclear facility, but the NRC rejected the state's appeal, siding with owner Energy. The federal government is still deliberating on the company's plans to reduce the 10-mile emergency planning zone. They don't seem to understand that there is still hot fuel there, still spent fuel there, and it's still dangerous, and something could go wrong. <coughs> On October 5th, Three Mile Island, everybody's favorite, had an alert declaration due to a fire in an auxiliary building. An alert is level two on the four-level scale that goes up to kiss your posterior goodbye. Halfway there. <coughs> Comanche Peak in Texas experienced a manual reactor trip during shutdown for a refueling outage. <coughs> Beaver Valley found two of 66 reactor vessel head penetrations in degraded condition. These flaws could grow to a size that could potentially jeopardize the structural integrity of the reactor vessel head pressure boundary. <coughs> and Sequoia in Tennessee, Braidwood in Illinois, and Callaway in Missouri all had report-worthy problems last week as well. Duck! <laughs> I know Mercury is retrograde, but this is ridiculous. Over to Switzerland, where in May of 2011, only two months after the Fukushima disaster began, both the Swiss Parliament and government decided to exit nuclear power production. Sounds good, right? But now Switzerland's Council of States, the upper chamber in the Federal Assembly, has agreed to avoid putting legal limits on the operating lives of the country's existing nuclear power reactors, and has also rejected a proposal that was supported by the Federal Nuclear Safety Inspectorate of requiring operators to submit a long-term operating concept every 10 years once a reactor reaches 40 years of service. So close to being this week's numbnuts. The U.S. has finally agreed to clear up the mess that they made in Spain in 1966 after two U.S. Air Force planes carrying four nuclear bombs collided in what has been called the worst nuclear accident in U.S. history. Seven crew members were instantly killed, while two bombs split apart, scattering radioactive material over a square mile of the Spanish town of Palomares. In the 49 years since then, only one quarter of the radioactive damage has been removed. 
Hundreds of municipalities in Quebec have joined First Nations to oppose uranium mining, worried that it could threaten their health, harm natural environments, and ruin traditional hunting and fishing. Currently, Saskatchewan is the only uranium-producing province in Canada and the second largest producer in the world behind Kazakhstan. And Mohamed al baradi who along with the International Atomic Energy Agency, for the computer tech to get the site finished and loaded. This is the late lamented but soon to be resurrected nuclearhotseat.com website. Computer things always take longer than expected, and we are still working to restore all of the files from Nuclear Hot Seat's database of over 220 audio recordings with their supporting material. It's quite daunting. For those of you who donated to help us along, my gratitude. The site is still being de-glitched, but know that it will look better, be more functional, more searchable, and more secure than ever before. Of course, there are still monthly operating costs for the program, so I don't want to discourage you if you still feel like donating to support ongoing production. You can go to the tattered remnants of the former site at NuclearHotSeat.com. That's where you can click on the big red Donate button, which connects you to a secure link so that you can make a donation either through PayPal or directly from your credit or debit card. And if you prefer not to donate online, email me. And I will give you a snail mail address where you can send your donation. Whatever you can do to help, thank you. Whatever you have done to help, thank you. And hang in there. We will get this done. The USS Ronald Reagan is a Nimitz class, not a numbnuts class. It really is a Nimitz class nuclear powered supercarrier that was sent on an humanitarian aid mission to Japan immediately upon the start of the Fukushima nuclear disaster in 2011. It began its relief work the day after the disaster began. Because there was no accurate information coming from Tokyo Electric Power Company to properly guide them as to the risks they faced, the ship sailed into the worst of the radioactive plume coming off the demolished plant, and it was several days before they learned how badly the sailors had been exposed to radiation, and by then, there was no way to mitigate their exposure. Since then, many of these sailors have become catastrophically ill. Two have died, as well as one child born to an exposed sailor, and there is currently a billion-dollar lawsuit against TEPCO filed on behalf of over 200 named sailors and all the others in our military and support services in Japan who were exposed to Fukushima's radiation. They number over 70,000. But what of the ship itself, the Ronald Reagan, consigned to some nuclear Siberia where it can no longer pose a threat to people or the environment? Hardly. As of October 1st, 2015, just last week, the ship has sailed into the harbor at Yokosuka on the island of Okinawa in Japan, where it will be home ported for the foreseeable future. What is the response of the Japanese people to this atomic reactor-powered supercarrier in their midst, in their waters? And is the ship really safe for the young American sailors on board? We try to find these answers with two interviews, originally presented on Nuclear Hot Seat number 173 from October 14 of 2014. First, we talked with Mr. Masahiko Goto, an attorney and one of the organizers of the Coalition Concerning Home Porting of the Nuclear Powered Carrier Vessel. We spoke via Skype from his home in Japan almost exactly one year ago. Mr. Goto-san, welcome to Nuclear Hot Seat. Thank you very much for inviting me to your program. First of all, what is your professional background? I am the attorney at law working in Yokosuka City. And how did you become interested in and involved in the issue of the home porting of nuclear-powered naval vessels from the United States? Fifteen years ago, there is information that the U.S. Navy 
is planning to home port our city for the nuclear powered carriers. That means we live with nuclear power plant in our city. So it's a very big problem. So that's why I became involved in this movement. When you say you live with the nuclear power plant, are you referring to the ones that are on board the ships that power them, or is this a separate reactor? The nuclear powered carrier has two nuclear reactors, and that corresponds to one nuclear power plant. So that means、uh, we live with the nuclear reactor in our city, very close to our residential area. How far back does the problem of home porting American nuclear powered vessels in Japan go? Meaning, how long ago did this problem start? Fifteen years ago, we began our campaign. And the U.S. Navy announced this plan formally in 2005. Before the announcement, We pointed out that the Navy and the Japanese government surely have the plan. And we pointed out the risky、uh, aspect of this plan. What was the response that you got when you pointed out the problems to the government? First, the government denied the existence of this plan. And next, the government neither deny nor confirm the plan. We pointed out the risky aspect of the home porting, but they continued denying the existence of the plan. And I think the government knows the dangerous aspect of this plan, but they prepared to introduce the U.S. nuclear powered carriers. To Japan because of the、uh, security problem. In September of 2008, the USS、mm-hmm. George Washington was、yes. deployed to your home city of Yokosuka. Yes. How did they justify it, or what did they say, or did they say anything? The Japanese government formally announced that the U.S. Navy will deploy the nuclear powered carriers in 2005, but our people and our city mayor w a s against the home putting of the nuclear powered carriers. And the Japanese government justified the home putting. One reason is it's safe. And One reason is it is necessary for our security program. We said it's a lie and it's not, it's wrong, but the Japanese government insisted the necessity of the nuclear powered carriers to Japan. You also have stated that the maintenance of nuclear powered carrier vessels may be in violation of a 1964 diplomatic agreement between Japan and the U.S. What is the nature of that agreement? One agreement is not to repair the reactor in Japanese port. And another agreement is not to hold out radioactive substances from the carriers in the port. But after the deployment in 2009, the U.S. Navy began the repair work in our port and put out radioactive substances from the nuclear powered carrier. And that's a violation of the, the agreement. And The radioactive material was released into the environment? Not released, but the agreement was do not carry out radioactive substances from the carrier. They put it in the container, and the crane takes the container to another vessel anchored at beside the carrier. It makes the risk of release 
of radioactive substances used to the environment. That's the problem. You co-founded Coalition Concerning Home Porting of the Nuclear-Powered Carrier Vessel. Mm -hmm. When did you do so, and what is that group, and what sort of things has it been doing? It was founded in 1998 when we got the information that the U.S. Navy is planning to deploy nuclear-powered carriers to Yokosuka. First, we collected as many signatures as possible to the Yokosuka mayor. Yokosuka mayor is the key person to avoid the deployment of the nuclear-powered carriers at that time. Once the Yokosuka mayor announced that we want the deployment of conventional carriers, in other words, he is against the deployment of nuclear-powered carriers to Yokosuka. What kind of an impact did that have on members of the ruling party as well as the Ministry of Foreign Affairs mm -hmm. when those concerns were voiced by the mayor and, I presume, the coalition as well? It's a shock for the government and the officials of foreign ministry because once the mayor was make the attitudes against the deployment of nuclear power carriers, they could not make the home putting of the nuclear power carriers because the nuclear power needs the dredging of the port. And uh, the mayor has the authority for the permission of the dredging in our port. So that was the reason the mayor was the key person for the home porting of the nuclear powered carriers. And yet that dredging did take place, did it not? Yes, because the mayor has changed his idea due to the pressure of the Japanese government and other political groups. So that's the key turning point for the deployment of the nuclear power carriers. It was two years before the deployment. After that time, we made our campaigns for two aspects. One is asking for the mayor to have the referendum for the deployment of the nuclear-powered carriers to Yokosuka. And we collected as many signatures for the referendum. Over 50,000 signatures in our city. But the mayor and the city council denied our proposal, and that was unsuccessful. Another campaign was the lawsuit asking for the court for injective relief for the dredging. 1,000 plaintiffs sued the Japanese government to stop the dredging work, but the court denied our motion. So it, that was also unsuccessful. It sounds like the Japanese government and the courts have been willing to bend over backwards to accommodate the U.S. naval vessels in port and the wishes of the United States government. Would you say that that is accurate? Yes, yes, uh, I, I suppose so. Now, how, if at all, has this situation changed since Fukushima? The public opinion drastically changed for our side. Before the accident of Fukushima, small part of Japanese people know the risk of the nuclear reactor. But it turns that many people came to know the risk of the nuclear reactor after the accident of Fukushima. So our town's opinion was much changed, very much changed. In what ways did the attitude change since Fukushima? A lot of mothers who have little children participated in our campaign. 
they played an important role in our campaign. Since September of 2008, the vessel that has been home ported in、mm-hmm. your city has been the USS George Washington.、Yes. But as of the fall of 2015, The USS、mm-hmm. Ronald Reagan, which of、yeah. course we followed on Nuclear Hot Seat, the、mm-hmm. law case,、mm-hmm. and all the rest. But it's the Reagan that is intended to go into port.、Mm-hmm. What are your concerns, and what, if anything, is being done before the Reagan comes to address this intended、mm-hmm. home porting? We are very concerned about the deployment of Reagan in two aspects. One as- aspect is that there is no working nuclear power plant in Japan. And、uh, it's a big issue that whether or not we start the nuclear power plant. And it's a national issue. This year, Japan has no working nuclear power plant, but still there is working a nuclear reactor in Yokosuka by the US Navy. And the deployment of the Reagan means that the only nuclear power reactor works in Yokosuka continues. So it's a national big issue for Japan. but No referendum or no hearing or no debate was made in Japan. That's a big problem. So we would like to campaign in nationwide that the deployment of the Reagan corresponds to the research of the nuclear power plant in Japan. The second aspect is that we have the information that the Reagan. Participated in the Operation Tomodachi after the accident of the Fukushima nuclear powered plant. And due to the operation, a lot of sailors on board the USS Reagan was covered by the radioactive releases by the Fukushima power plant. And we know that over 100 sailors. Are now suing TEPCO in the United States court, and that case was not settled. The damage was so serious. We are now planning to visit San Diego to meet the victim lawyers next week. So that means that the Reagan is so contaminated by Operation Tomodachi. And once the Reagan will be deployed to Yokosuka, Japanese worker will repair the Reagan, and that makes the contamination to the Japanese workers and Japanese people. So the Reagan is not in good conditions、uh, for radioactive aspects. But once the Reagan is deployed in our city, It makes a low level contamination to our workers and to our people as well. That's the problem. With you coming to the United States, to San Diego and also San Francisco this week, what do you hope to accomplish with your trip? We will meet the attorneys for the TEPCO case and to meet the sailors. And interview them and would like to know the serious damage by the Operation Tomodachi. Japanese people do not know the real situation, serious situation of the sailors. So we would like to get as much information from them and let the Japanese people know the serious situation of the Reagan sailors. And we would like to make the campaigns with them, not to make any more victims by nuclear reactor. What can the listeners of Nuclear Hot Seat do to help support、mm-hmm. you in this work? First, I hope all the US people know the risk of the nuclear powered plant 
as well as nuclear powered carriers. They have same kinds of risks. So we hope the US people will make campaigns to abolish all the nuclear powered plants as well as nuclear powered carriers. Once the nuclear powered carriers will make accident, big harm will be over your residential areas. If the United States will make decision to abolish all the nuclear powered carriers, our campaign will be successful. Boy, do I ever hope that happens. Is there anything else that you would like to add that we haven't covered? We would like the United States people know that near the Yokosuka areas, there are a lot of risk of the earthquake and tsunami, as well as Fukushima power plant. In our residential areas, the high risk of occurring earthquake is reported. For example, 30% in next 30 years. So if the earthquake occurs, the same kind of accident with Fukushima power plant will occur to our city, and it's a big problem. So we would like the U.S. people know that in Japan, there are many earthquakes occurring every day or every week, every month. So it is not good that the U.S. blows the nuclear power carriers to Japan. Well, we certainly wish the coalition concerning home porting of the nuclear-powered carrier vessel every success in your campaigns. And Mr. Masahiko Gotu-san, thank you so very much for being our guest this week on Nuclear Hot Seat. Yes, uh, thank you very much. That was attorney Mr. Masahiko Gotu-san representing the Yokosuka-based anti-nuclear group Coalition Concerning Home Porting of the Nuclear-Powered Carrier Vessel. Next, Carol Jonkow is the Director Emerita of Peace Resource Center of San Diego, where she worked for over 30 years. Carol has been involved in anti-nuclear power and weapons issues for many years, including the recent successful campaign to close the San Onofre nuclear power plant. She has visited the Far East to speak about her work three times, including presentations in Japan, South Korea, and other Pacific ports. Here's what she had to share about the USS Reagan, also recorded for Nuclear Hot Seat number 173 from October 14, 2014. The USS Ronald Reagan, which is home ported right now in San Diego, was near uh, Japan and was sent into Fukushima on a earthquake tsunami rescue operation and because of the limited information and incorrect information we now know that TEPCO was providing the Japanese government the same happened with the US government and the sailors and pilots on this ship were exposed to the Fukushima radiation you know, they sailed directly into the plume. I've heard stories from local people, for example, about pilots that flew through the Fukushima plume, and then there was a lot of radiation on the ship. And so I think that that ship came back to San Diego, and we now know that many of the sailors on that ship have become ill. We've been covering that story very closely on Nuclear Hot Seat, including interviews with the attorneys, with Steve Simmons, and I actually traveled down to San Diego to cover one of the hearings about two months ago. So the listeners are familiar with that angle, but it's fascinating that you're now saying that there are pilots known to have flown through there who are perhaps experiencing negative health impact. Yes, correct. And, you know, in just my own conversation with the attorneys of, you know, a lot of the, uh, some of the, the sailors that they are representing are very ill. I think the connection right now is the first we had a ship come back here that was supposedly cleaned, uh, you know, while they were trying to scrub down the Ronald Reagan. They did come into harbor. 
the contaminated materials that they had collected during their cleaning were still on the ship and had to be disposed of here in San Diego, and we don't know a whole lot about that. So that's an issue with us. And now the USS Ronald Reagan is scheduled to be transferred to Japan, to Yokosuka, in the summer of 2015. And this is of great concern to people there because they want to know really what happened. You know, is the ship still contaminated? Uh, I think there's a whole connection there that's ongoing with the Japanese people really not, and particularly in Yokosuka, not wanting to accept these nuclear aircraft carriers because of the hazards that they pose. In the first interview I did with Steve Simmons, who was a sailor on the Reagan and is now permanently disabled and in a wheelchair, he spoke of a friend of his who was involved with the plumbing, with the pipes, Reagan and elsewhere. And this individual, who was not named, said that once the radiation gets into the system, there is no way to decontaminate without removing all of the pipes and replacing with brand new pipes. And I do not believe that has actually happened on the Reagan. So the Japanese people in Yokosuka and the rest of the country deserve to be at least on high alert that what's coming into their port may be carrying radioactivity that has not been contained. That is of great concern, and it's of great concern to me here in San Diego to know that that ship is still sitting here and that sailors continue to be exposed to that. And when we talk about pipes and releases of coolant water, I mean, we just get into these issues where the Navy does not tell us what is actually happening. you know. And so there's that great area of distrust of not knowing the degree of contamination that may or may not still exist. The sailors on the Reagan had originally been told that what they were exposed to, I believe, was just, you know, the same as an extra month of background radiation. But the truth is they were exposed to a lot of particulates and have become very ill. This is part of what's happening, I think, in Yokosuka with bringing this ship in, is they really want to know Is that ship still contaminated by Fukushima radiation? It doesn't make a whole lot of sense with the problems going on in Japan with the ongoing exposures and risks to bring more. (laughs) Let's bring the Fukushima waste back. There's an issue there just to begin with. And then there's always the issue of the nuclear-powered vessels and the the likelihood of accidents with those. So the Japanese have not wanted nuclear-powered aircraft carriers. That was Carol Jongkow, Director Emerita of Peace Resource Center of San Diego. And now, the nuclear hot seat, Filmmaker Spotlight. The International Uranium Film Festival in Berlin last week awarded their highest honor, the prestigious Yellow Oscar named after yellow cake uranium, to German filmmaker Marcus Schwenzel for his deeply affecting short dramatic film about a child at Chernobyl. Nuclear Hot Seat caught up with him just a few days after that impressive win. Hi, my name is Marcus Schwenzel. I'm from Berlin, and my film is called Seven Years of Winter. Tell us what your film is about. Maybe it's a very simple story. It's about a boy who is being sent into the Chernobyl zone after the atomic reactor went off. And he is asked by his older brother um, to ransack the buildings for valuables and bring them outside. And the funny story is, or the funny thing about it is, that the boy is actually very happy when he's inside the zone because there is no other people. Yeah, So he feels kind of safe. But at the same time, of course, um, it's damaging his body. So it's kind of healing his soul and damaging his body at the same time. It's quite saddening. In the end, he finds some traces of his own history. I have to say that I watched the film. It's about 20 minutes long. And I do not understand any of the languages that were either spoken or that were shown in subtitles. But I still found it tremendously moving to watch this young boy moving through Chernobyl. Was it 
difficult to get permission to shoot and to shoot so extensively in the exclusion zone. It's very easy, um, Libby. Um, it's the easiest thing on earth to go into the zone, yeah? And it's really, sometimes it's a bottle of, of um, vodka, sometimes it's cigarettes. You can book these trips where you go inside and you pay, I think, $50, and they bring you right in front of the plant, yeah? Which is pretty shocking. So it's very easy to go inside. It's also easy to get a permission. Um, actually, I don't think you need permission. If you have someone with you and, you know, it's, it's kind of a weird situation. So what moved you to make this film, to choose this as a subject and to subject yourself to the radiation at Chernobyl in order to make it? When Chernobyl happened, I was, I think, 16 years old. And it was a big shock for so many people because um, the, the clouds were coming over Germany and also in our part of you know, suddenly it was raining, and until now you can't eat mushrooms there. So it was shocking for everyone, and um, that stayed. And then at the same time, Chernobyl has such a strange fascination, yeah? Also, when you go in there, it's probably the saddest place on earth, and it's a terrible place to be, um, and I will not go there again because it does something with you that, it changes something in you, but... Um, it also has a fascination and it has its own beauty. So it always kept me interested in the location. I was interested in the location. So, and with me, it's always like that, Libby, that I first have, an, have a location and then comes the story. So I always have this place and then I write a story in it. And, and that's how it happened with Chernobyl and, and the seven years. Now, you just said that when you go to Chernobyl, it changes something. Are you talking about physiologic changes? Are you talking about psychological or spiritual changes? Psychological and spiritual. First of all, we know so little about what it really does because our we have these measurements at the time, but who knows what we will find out about radiation a hundred years from now. So it's very limited. And what it does leave is you go in there and there is a great sadness. Yeah? And it does make you very sad. It feels almost like it's like an emotional vacuum. Vacuum? Vacuum? And people say you don't feel it, but I believe you can feel it. You know? What makes you so sad is that you see all those animals and those bees and those, you know, these creatures who live there, and they don't, it makes me so that sad that they don't even know what's going on. That's even worse, you know, because it's something you, you cannot turn the, the clock back. You know, and it's a very weird to the outmost fucked up place. Sorry for the word, but it's very, very bad. It's a very bad experience. Are you anti-nuclear in other aspects of your life, or was it just for this one film? I'm very anti-nuclear. I think the, the nuclear question is probably the most dangerous question for mankind, yeah? Because it, it's one of those things that you can play with, but you, once it happened, you cannot turn it back. And I think the risk that something happens is, is there, yeah? Sooner or later, probably it will happen, I suppose, you know? That someone blows a, blows a bomb or another reactor goes off. And it's a very bad thing because you cannot turn it back. You know, and I'm, I'm very anti, I'm very anti-nuclear. Your film, Seven Years of Winter, has just been awarded the Yellow Oscar by the International Uranium Film Festival. Congratulations. Yeah. And I much. know that the film has been shown there. What has been the response of audiences? I have shown it to several festivals, and the response is always the same. There is a certain... Um, quietness after it and it takes a while to settle and then the applause and then interest in general how is it in the zone how was it filming in there so it had a it, it was well taken yesterday it was it had a very good response and I must say I love this festival yeah it's one of those festivals where I'm extremely proud to be shown it because the other films were amazing and I'm proud to be one of those films and it's, it's one of those festivals where I see that the people who do it, they really have this, you know, this belief, and it makes me very happy. It's a very good experience, this festival. What are you aiming for with this film, and what do you hope it will accomplish? What I hope to aim for is to show it in schools. 
because it has the right length, I would be more than happy if this film could be um, shown to kids. Because I think kids will understand it totally different than we do, yeah? And I think it will do something to them in a way that they can understand it because it's about a boy who is their own age. So it's my dream to, to bring it into the schools. The characters in the film are speaking in Russian. And yes. the version that I saw that you sent me the link to has subtitles in German, neither one of which did me any good. <laughs> The Uranium Film Festival is planning to come to Los Angeles yes. next year for the Hollywood yes. community. Any yes. plans to put English subtitles on it so that we can partake of the richness of the film? That's, that's a promise, and we will be working on it as soon as possible. Promise I will do it. We will hold you to that. All success to you on the film. Thank you, Lydia. It was more than great to talk to you. Award-winning filmmaker Marcus Spenzel on Nuclear Hot Seat Filmmaker Spotlight. By the way, if you wish to watch the film in Russian with German subtitles still, you can Google Seven Years of Winter, spell out the word seven, and the YouTube link will show up. Activist shout-outs! The Nuclear Regulatory Commission is still taking comments on their ill-conceived consideration of the junk science hormesis, the lame brain theory that tries to convince us that up is down, black is white, and radiation is good for you. This is being proposed as a change from the proven science of the linear no-threshold model, which has been the gold standard for decades in evaluating radiation risk. Linear no-threshold holds that any and every dose of radiation is potentially harmful, it accumulates in the body, and we need to protect ourselves from it. That's why pregnant women no longer get x-rays of their fetuses. But the NRC's petitioners propose that their flawed standard be used instead for determining radiation risk under all circumstances. Talk about the war on sanity. Your comments are needed on the NRC's site. Right now, they only have 152 comments. And the other side has been drumming up noise in major mainstream media to support their side. So we need your comments. Yes, you. You over there who hasn't commented yet. You can comment by going to regulations.gov. That's plural. Regulations.gov. Search hormesis. No, it's not spelled W-H-O-R-E at the beginning, much as I would like to. It is spelled H O R M E. S -I -S, then the top item that shows up in your search will be the petition. Get your cards and letters in now. We have until November 18th. And Kimberly Roberson and I created a program called RAPT, R-A-P-T, which stands for Radiation Awareness Protection Talk. It covers a wealth of information about best possible practices to protect against radiation damage to the body. Nothing's a slam dunk, but there are things you can do. Together, Kimberly and I are hosting an information call on detoxification and zeolite this Sunday, October 11th, at 4 p.m. Eastern, 1 p.m. Pacific Time. It will include a presentation by a biochemist, the man who developed a liquid zeolite product. You can get on the call by dialing 712 432-6100 and enter code 886-838-800 and then hit the pound sign. Or the shortcut would be to check our Facebook invitation under The Natural Science of Natural Cellular Defense. Here's today's final thought. Or thoughts. Some strays that have been hanging around. I think it would be great to get the question to every current candidate for their party's nomination for president, what is your position on nuclear energy? If elected, what will you do to ensure that the Nuclear Regulatory Commission genuinely lives up to its motto, protecting people and the environment? What will you do about Canada's plans to open a high-level nuclear waste dump within one mile of the shores of Lake Huron? And feel free to add in any others of your choosing. 
Not that I expect much sanity from the Republican side of the aisle, but let's hear from Hillary Clinton. Let's hear something more substantive from Bernie Sanders. Let's give Dr. Jill Stein of the Green Party a shot at it. And Joe Biden, should he decide to enter the race. Heck, let's bring back Al Gore. Give him another chance to speak about the environment. I would like to see, but probably I'm going to have to write, a sketch based on Antiques Roadshow, where the value, quote-unquote, of antique nuclear reactors, you know, one of those 40-plus-year-old General Electric boiling water reactor monsters, where one of those is discussed in the style of that long-running hit PBS program, and how those of us who have paid for it got snookered a long time ago. I think the testimony of the mothers of Fukushima needs to be turned into a stage play a la the vagina monologues, where three guest actors of the female persuasion could read from script while sitting on stools. Cheap to produce, easy to attract name talent for a limited commitment, and a powerful way to communicate the heartbreaking truth of that nuclear disaster. And I wonder... On whatever day the world actually wakes up and realizes what we have done to ourselves vis-a-vis -vis nuclear, what would the day after that look like? This has been Nuclear Hot Seat for Tuesday, October 6, 2015. Material for this week's program has been researched and compiled from enenews.com, presenza.com, theolivepress.es, redgreenandblue.org, Wall Street Journal, fukuleaks.org, japantimes.com, timesunion.com, knoxblogs.com, stlouis.cbslocal.com, abqjournal.com, Nuclear Regulatory Commission, and Erica Gray for making us aware of what they are saying. WPRI.org, Cape Cod Baywatch.org, the It's Always Halloween Writing Ghouls at the World Nuclear News, and the good guys and gals of the Nuclear Hot Seat community on Facebook, which you are all invited to join. Theme music written by me, sung by Mary Lee Weber, accompanied by John Barnard. Nuclear Hot Seat is syndicated by UCY.tv and is also available on iTunes under podcasts. Our 220-plus episode archive will soon again be available on NuclearHotSeat.com. Until then, you can access episodes via iTunes under Podcasts or on YouTube at the Nuclear Hot Seat Videos site. Nuclear Hot Seat is the activist voice on nuclear issues, so if you have a story lead, a hot tip, or a suggestion of someone to interview, send an email to info at nuclearhotseat.com. We are copyright 2015, Libby Halevi and Hardestry Communications. All rights reserved, but fair use allowed as long as proper attribution is provided. This is Libby Halevi of Hardestry Communications, the heart of the art of communicating, reminding you that we have all had our nuclear wake-up call we may keep hitting the snooze bar, but it keeps going off again and again. So do not, repeat not, go back to sleep, because we are all in the nuclear hot seat.